there should be a little thing for you to hit. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performing at our best when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. So I've been waiting a long time for this conversation. It's been really cool. Uh, Seth and I have been trading like lots of stuff on Twitter over a while, and it's great to finally sit down. Um, our guest this episode, to introduce him formally before I just start rambling, is Dr. Seth Collings Hawkins. He's an anthropologist, a writer, a physician. He's double-boarded in emergency medicine medicine and EMS, and specializes in wilderness medical care. He's an associate professor of emergency medicine at Wake Forest University and the founder of the Carolina Wilderness EMS Externship, which is a program we're going to be talking about today. He's also the editor of Wilderness EMS, the primary textbook for former wilderness excuse me, formal wilderness medical operations. He serves as a medical director or advisor for numerous organizations, including North Carolina Outward Bound, REI, the National Association for Search and Rescue, the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, multiple wildland fire medical support teams, and much, much more. Uh, so if that's not enough to get you excited about this conversation, I, I don't know what is. Before we formally jump in, a quick plug. Uh, there are so many ways to get involved in the Emergency Mind Project community, and we would absolutely love to have you on board. The easiest is to take our free crisis skills test. Go to emergencymind.com and you'll find it in the upper right. All right. All that said, Seth, thank you so much for jumping on and welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to be here. Big fan for a long time. And uh, like you said, our work has intersected so much. I'm excited to get to share some of the ways that those intersections land. And I, you know, I and I was trying to remember how it was that we started talking, and I think it was something to do with the externship. So, so maybe that's a maybe that's a worthwhile place to start. Like, jump us in right into that. Like, what is the externship, and what is it that y'all are doing? Yeah, yeah. I think the dialogue began when I said we're using your book because it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so the textbook uh, um, Emergency Mind is required reading for our externs. Externs are a, a pun, so they're. Mm -hmm like interns that have to be outside. So we thought we were very <laughs> clever with that. Um, so this project started formally in 2011, although uh, it began a few years before in its germination uh, for my work doing wilderness EMS. So I live in Burke County in North Carolina, which is about half um, federal land and state park land, huge uh, resources and huge opportunities for rescue and medical care in the wilderness. Um, including the deepest gorge in the Eastern United States and the largest state park in North Carolina, uh, and frequently the highest number of searches on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So uh, I moved there, started doing this work. I, I moved in 2003, and by 2009, 10, people were asking me to come shadow, which is a experience that I really despise. <laughs> in, in that it's a, and I apologize for people who use a shadowing model, and for some things it's great, but I passionately think that medical students and resident physicians should not be shadowing, they should be doing, and they should mm -hmm. be participating, and they should be active in what they're involved in. Edward Bound has a great philosophy of crew, not passengers, mm -hmm. and I wasn't particularly interested in taking passengers on board um, to watch what we were doing. I thought, hey, you should be training in this, and even more so, this idea of people coming and working with me was problematic as a shadowing element because uh, all the work that most of the work that's done in wilderness EMS and rescue and search and rescue is uh, episodic, ad hoc, unplanned. My fear was people would come, they'd hang out in my house, sure. we'd watch some movies, nothing would happen. <laughs> you know, it's not like going to the emergency department and working a shift, which is critically important for this um, for this field of medicine to understand that this is. Uh, I think I think we lost you there for a minute, mate. Mm. Hopefully you come back up. The epitome of the swarm team. Like if I was gonna uh, Seth, come I'm up sorry, dude. We we lost you. We lost you there for a second, man. Um you, you said it's critically important for this field to understand, and then and then you cut out. And I'm so curious what it's critically important for this field to understand. We gotta it's go. It's like leaving you on the there. cliffhanger. I know, That's right? Exactly. I did yeah. it. I was like I the tantalizing. Um, <laughs> I think it was critically important to understand that this is generally not shift work at the physician mm. level. Gotcha. So for people who, you know, obviously there's paramedics on duty and there's certain limited personnel who are assigned to tasks, but in general, this tends to be episodic and 
triggered by an incident where multiple personnel are responding from different places, really old school, 20th century, people getting out of their bed in the middle of the night to go help a climber who's fallen. Um, and that's like a perfect definition of a swarm team. Like, I feel mm. like if you ever wanted like a great swarm team, yeah. example, we call it parking lot triage, where something happens in a parking lot of a national park or U.S. forest, and you start looking at the stickers on the cars to see who you can pull together to like, oh, you've got a star of life. Like, need, what's your credential? And they're like, I'm an EMT. Mm. And you're like, That's awesome. So in that sense, it's important to understand that this brand of medical care is not usually driven by shifts or things that are easy to come and observe. So my concept was, why not take a small number of people, train them exquisitely, give them truly an operational patient-centered experience where they would come and live uh, in our county. They would have to be outside of four walls the whole time and get experience education in this version of medical care, which was authentic and which actually involved patients. So another reason that that was meaningful to me was the state motto of North Carolina, which is Esse Quam Videre. So we adopted the state motto as our own motto. That's Latin from Cicero, meaning to be rather than to appear to be. And so many wilderness medicine hmm. trainings were going to a hospital where you would watch PowerPoints on hypothermia. Sure. Um, you would have uh, trainings uh, in the in the emergency department. You'd probably do some shifts in the emergency department. And the thing that was missing was the actual patients and the actual like activities that were happening yeah. in a wilderness area. And my belief was that there are a ton of patients out there that desperately need services and we weren't reaching them by training people in the mm -hmm. hospital. So to be rather than to appear to be was a little bit of putting medical education on its head and saying, instead of going to the hospital and learning from physicians, how about you come out here and learn from paramedics? and learn from swift water rescue technicians and learn from EMTs, which was, you know, flattering in their sense because these, these EMS personnel felt like, oh, the doctors are the ones that tell us what to do. And I was saying, that's actually not the case. Probably doctors in training to come out and learn from you because you're the ones who are actually doing it mm -hmm. and you have a much more authentic experience to draw from. And then put that student out on a cliff at two in the morning you know, let them deliver patient care and then see what the real challenges are. And that's when you graduate them saying, you've really inhabited this role and you haven't just talked about it or talked around it, which is important. Like in nowhere else in medicine or any discipline, do we just theoretically talk about things? Like we want our trainees to actually be in there doing it and kind of living the experience. So that experience education component was really critical. So in 2011, it launched as an experiment, we took one student, we had him come here. He was not allowed to be in a building unless there was nothing else going on. He just responded to whatever was happening in an EMS and wilderness setting during that month. Um, it was very successful, I think. And since then, usually we garner the best month of medical school, <laughs> like right. evaluation from the yeah. students. And it's frankly, it's a low threshold, not, not, you know, to run down medical education, but to build up the fact that you put people out in these amazing areas sure. and you give them amazing experiences. And, you know, I don't have to do too much to make it a wonderful experience. But I think the other thing that we do that is above and beyond just simply putting people out in the woods is build a package of mentorship. Hmm. So what's maybe different from other sort of medical school rotations or other educational experiences is that I and increasingly the externs who have graduated who now come back to contribute to the program really kind of invest in that month our own life experience. So hmm. again, in a, in a credibility and essay quambidere kind of way, there is no, our lives are completely transparent. Like there is no, you know, this is how you act when you're on duty and then you go home and do something else. Like they, they see my life, you know, completely through all elements of it, including family life, including off-duty time, including how do you navigate the on-duty, off-duty sort of uh, interface in this job where like you work a shift in the emergency department and that night your your radio goes off, your pager goes off and do you respond or not? Have you been drinking alcohol? Sure. What does your spouse say? Um, and I think that mentorship thing unexpectedly has become very big in it as well mm -hmm. in the sense that, especially medical education, but maybe in other elements of our world, sometimes we've kind of lost an apprenticeship sort of model where people have a deep relationship with 
singular people who they really see through the entirety of their professional life and they can ask questions and see things modeled and they can challenge things that look, you know, inappropriate. So um, I think that's ended up being a big part of it as well. Mm. So interesting, man. And you're right that it's so different than a lot of the medical education that we're, that we're seeing, right? Um, the shadowing idea is, is really fascinating. I think for folks that don't operate in a system that uses shadows, it's worth backtracking for one second to be like, you know, what, what are we even talking about? So th there's this idea that, um, and I honestly, don't, I don't know if it comes from the thought that uh, medicine is just so different than everything else. We tend to have that thought a lot. I think we're wrong about it, but we tend to have that thought a lot. Uh, but we you know, medicine is so different than everything else. So there's value just in showing up and and being a fly in the wall and watching. And there is certainly value in showing up and being a fly in the wall and watching, right? Like you can show up, you can watch team dynamics and you'll get a first rate view of what's happening in it. You can watch trauma and try to understand the way the system works together. You can watch the mental models and the things that are being used for it. You can understand, you know, what patient care is really about to a degree. I think it's a necessary and important, but not clearly not sufficient way to train anybody to really be a doctor. Um, but it's fascinating what you're saying because you, there's not a lot of systems within the formal medical education world that operate in the way that you're doing, right? Very few times are you just put on call right at the beginning. Yeah, and I, I think um, there's all sorts of ways that wilderness medicine and wilderness EMS is different um, within the medical world. And then we have been frankly trying to disrupt some uh, measures or some steps that the medical education system has has begun to implement that that you know may be familiar in other disciplines as well. So, yeah, the shadowing element there's there's a, a ton that can be gained by watching, and I think there's a lot that can be gained by simulation. My fear about the world as it's starting to evolve is that watching and simulation are becoming acceptable replacements for the real thing when the real thing might be available. And that's my concern is the 16 medical students that walk into an exam room and they're peering over each other's shoulders to look at the rash, you know, like there is an element to which that will be necessary, but in our model, actually putting somebody in the place of doing the skills is irreplaceable. So my personal conviction is that shadowing, observation, uh, unless they have specific purposes where, you know, you're, you're like, it's a great for us. It's a great activity to go out into the waiting room and, you know, see how patients like exist in the waiting room before they see us. And that is its own, you know, benefit. That's its own reality. But I think we may overemphasize the importance of things like simulation and observation to the detriment of actually doing the thing, because then when you step in to do the thing, all sorts of things make sense. You say, oh, now I understand. You know, you get the tactile memory. You get, you understand why something went this way or, or not that way. And, and high fidelity simulation gets better and better and closer to it. But I think we always need to remember, A, the, you know, platonic ideal, the real thing is you doing this for a patient. And then if that's already available, there's no need to try to simulate it. So, you know, my message in 2011 to the wilderness medicine world was there's a lot of patients out there. There's a lot of emergencies. There's a lot of rescues. We do not need to sit in a hospital in a, in a, you know, auditorium talking about this. We should be going out and doing the thing and helping people with it. And then the other part, I think that was really important from a mentorship and understanding the way of the world element was disrupting um, hierarchies. So mm. the medical world, like many worlds that you know, our high performance and that, you know, are mission critical, vertical hierarchies can be very um, entrenched. So, and, and and we talk about this in the textbook, Wilderness EMS, that, you know, the senior resident is over the junior resident, is over the intern, is over the medical student, is over the shadowing, you know, high schooler. And so to disrupt that, we sometimes ask who is over who, the nurse or the paramedic? And it's like the marital status of the number seven. It's a nonsensical, <laughs> it's a question that yeah. reveals that there is actually no meaning to that hierarchical system in that place. So we proposed a horizontal hierarchy in our training program and really in wilderness EMS in general that argues the most important person for any particular activity is the one who has the most suitability and training for that action. So 
um, it doesn't matter if you're, this is where it's hard sometimes for paramedics and medical students to like figure out where they fit in because the paramedic feels like they're supposed to be deferring to the physician. Our message is in that environment, you are supposed to be learning and you're supposed to be deferring to somebody who has more technical skills in that environment. And the reason I bring all this up yeah, is, sure. important, is there is a tendency in our culture to think that doctors run things that, you know, oh, if there's a search and a, a you know, the doctor thinks they're going to run things, the team thinks they're going to run things. And, and the important message to get out is like, no, <laughs> if you don't actually know how to um, adequately ski, you're not supposed to be the person, you know, yeah going out for the person who's stuck on the ski mountain, it's a ski patroller. And I think that gets lost sometimes in inappropriate deferral to people. And then also this fascination we have with letters after our name. And what really matters is the is the actual skills. It's a very practical, uh, pragmatic approach to say, you know, get over yourself and listen to the people that actually know what they're doing. All right. So, so that's so fascinating, right? So let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So you are... Uh, Actually, instead of instead of making this up, perhaps I can ask: Can you give us a scenario that might be a typical one where you're doing a rescue like this, so that we can explore some of this group dynamic sort of think that's going in there? And where, where I hope we go with this, although I am not wedded to this idea, just like the number seven, we can move into the space where we're talking about the way that teams self-assemble on an objective and decide in a relatively quick and facile manner the the network of leadership and how then that leadership might change depending on what the task at hand is. Yeah, yeah, so so important and that really is that swarm concept. So mm. one example from our own experience uh two externs in a car with a um with a high school age like a senior in high school firefighter going out to a drowning mm. and they end up at the at the gate and they're punching in the key that dispatch has given them and it doesn't get them through the gate to get to that body of water where the drowning is. And the whole time, the firefighter has been saying, I don't think this can be right. That dispatch code, that's for the other side of the county. But they were really quiet because they were just the like firefighter high schooler and these fancy pants medical students that were, you know, doing the actual response were the ones, uh, you know, figuring out where they're going to go. And so one, I think, you know, important concept in, in sort of the evolve element of, you know, prepare, perform, recover, evolve is, is the debrief. And, and, and that, and the experience education demands that. And so afterwards we were like, why did you not listen to this kid who obviously lives here and knows this better? And we were asking the firefighter, why didn't you just like <laughs> shake him and say, you're going to the wrong place. But there were these hierarchies and there were these pre-established understandings of who was in charge and who you know knew more and clearly the person who knew more in that situation was the local person who knew um the environment and i think in in you know more, more of a direct medical care sort of setting i think if if uh so if you're on a river and you have somebody out in the river they've gotten their foot entrapped their airways going underwater this is you know critical intervention somebody has to get out in the swift water and get the person's airway above water rapidly and they have a broken ankle that's keeping their head under and you've got a fellowship trained ankle specialist orthopedist on the shore or a swift water rescue technician who would you send in yeah and totally. that is sort of a laughable kind of scenario but if you just scale that back a bit i think you to me what i would train people in in this environment for sort of swarm response and and really kind of navigating egos, qualifications, you know, what people have done is being very, very, very pragmatic, very oriented towards who's the most likely person to be able to accomplish the task that's, that's at hand and has the most experience around that particular element. And that's just not something that we're very good at because we have all these other preconceptions about what people's qualifications are and what their roles are. I'm not saying it's easy, but I do think in, in terms of rewiring our understandings um, of how that should work, it has to be goal oriented. And as, as physicians or as people who are leaders in other spaces, we're sometimes the ones who are not good at it. Like we step in and feel like we're there to take control. And sure. that's why physicians are often disliked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, no, totally. totally. EMS calls. 
Yeah. So what's the, do you all have a framework or something you use in that moment to sort through who should go? Because it, it's rarely as easy as people showing up with a shirt that says, I'm a fellowship trained ankle specialist. And this guy's got an, you know, you could, you could argue which one of them is wearing, you know, Patagonia or REI or something that might give you the the differentiating factor, but like they they don't usually say what their job is and what their skill set is. And the the in-hospital mirror of this situation, by the way, is running a cardiac arrest or a code blue on a floor where you don't know anybody, right? So you show up, maybe you're part of the designated response team and you show up to a room where there's a lot of people and you don't necessarily know who those people are. And there's this moment of like, what are you doing in there? So what do you all do for that? What's the framework about how to decide yeah. who a medical person is? So there's two huge bins that this goes into. One is the regulated practice of medicine so and, and, and regulated medical operations. So to the extent that there's a rescue, which is being managed by a jurisdictional authority that has the legal responsibility to build the response, and there are people there who represent that, um, that is very swarmy in the sense that Usually in these spaces, there are not enough formal people like, like, you know, the national, like the U.S. Forest Service would not be deploying frequently rangers in enough numbers to be able to effect a rescue, but they, they may provide the jurisdictional authority that builds structure around that. So one element, even in a swarm setting, is somebody who is pre-designated a legal apparatus to accomplish this. So in the hospital, oftentimes you figure out who the person is who's pre-designated as that role, and then they start having to figure out all the ancillary support uh, people. So this little incident command um, structure builds right away when there's a formal pre-designated incident and somebody who is legally responsible for a command. And that's really important for people to appreciate if they're not familiar with wilderness uh, remote operations is this idea of authority having jurisdiction and that there will be ultimately an incident command that will have to be answered to. So then it's, then it's not the time to like, if you're like a climber and you know a ton about climbing rescue, you still have to defer legally to the authority that that is stepping in there, even if you feel like they're you know not doing the right thing. Um, that advocacy and patient you know uh, role is something that we're familiar with in all environments for trying to appeal to somebody who has that you know sure. um, vested authority. On the other hand, the other bin, which is equally possible, is truly human beings in a threatening environment assembling and trying to accomplish a goal. And this is like, you know, 9-11 airplane. This is climbing fall where somebody falls and there's, you know, 18 people in the area who all just go running over because the person just fell. Um, raft flips and somebody's drowning. So in that situation, it doesn't, you know, there's no time for like, you know, you're calling 911, but they're hours away. So right. then you're right. Then you really are. And in our, in our, you know, programs, if we were in that situation, which hopefully wouldn't be unlikely because we're spending so much time in those environments, we're hoping to bring a lot of that credibility so it can be quickly captured. We're EMS physicians that have particular training in wilderness EMS. We have you know, wilderness paramedic credentials if we do, and we specialize in this kind of work. That carries a lot of weight for, hey, I'm, you know, somebody's probably hopefully pretty thankful to hear that the language there that's meaningful though is things that are germane to that environment because if we then meet somebody and they're like oh you know this is not to throw any profession or medical specialty under the bus but if they're like oh i'm a pathologist and i'm on you know the first hike of my life then hopefully we can kind of negotiate out you know the yeah. same as we would if we were asking them for an opinion about like a histology slide like how about i totally take run the ball on this and so this is where um, this is where I think, although it's frequently criticized, this is where things like credentialing, getting certificates, getting things that are some sort of objective measurement of your qualifications become rapidly helpful as code. So if you can mm -hmm. say something like, I'm an EMT, I have swift water rescue training, people know what that is, and then they can translate that into something meaningful. But then it's on us as an industry to ensure Saquon Videre style, that you can't just get that by, you know, phoning up, doing a, you know, Zoom call, but you actually, there's some credibility to that, to that training. So then building in, in, you know, teeth to that. So that brings us back to why I take my students and I put them out there because if physicians get a reputation like, oh, they have wilderness training, but it was in a, in a hotel 
during a conference and they never step foot outside, that will not do well for our industry. Sure. So there's there's a couple of things that you're getting at here that are worth sort of poking at a little bit. And when when we talk about swarming, we typically, at least on this podcast, talk about leading a swarm, right? We talk about coming into a situation and assembling a swarm around that. We less frequently talk about the self-assembly of a swarm, and we even less frequently talk about following in a swarm. And I think those are both really critical skill sets also that that maybe we can dovetail into a little bit. Um, you know, there is this real tendency once you have any sort of training to try to take command and step forward into it, right? And I, I you know, will share the embarrassing story of me being like a brand new medical intern at something and responding to an event and pushing somebody out of the way because I'm the ER doctor, you know, newly minted the plastic still on my stethoscope and everything. Right. Only to find out I, who I had shoved away was the like 30 or 40 year veteran of the field who I didn't even know enough to know. I didn't realize. And, you know, like, I, like I have some compassion for that younger version of me that didn't know his ass from his elbow from that. But I, I'm also like, all right, well, probably that should have been a thing we talked about ahead of time as as we're going out into the world about this. So there's certainly ways not to do it. But for a moment, like, let's ignore that leadership decision about who takes command, right? So let's say that you're in this field, that there's somebody in the river, there's a bunch of us floating around, and magically there really does happen to be a exceedingly experienced wilderness paramedic with swift water rescue training who has done all of the things and has all of the everything. And they're like, great, I'm in command. What happens to the rest of the team? What, what are slots two through X look like? How do you slot into them? And what's an ideal situation? Maybe also what's not ideal, but what you average see or where are their pitfalls? And how can folks listening to this improve their ability to self-assemble a swarm team on a problem set? Yeah, this is so important. And I love the idea of a slight redirect from leadership to support. And this is such a great case study for that, especially for people like physicians. So showing up at an incident where you are actually not the most highly trained person, but you have a ton of um, skills to bring to bear that are not you know, the leadership role um, is what one of the really big things that I think I'm trying to train the students in here. And they, I think to a person would say they come out being told how humble they have to be. And that, I think that affect of humility and, and being willing to be a follower is the, the positioning that then leads into the best leader being found. Because if you have a collection of people who are not seeking that role, and then you sort of select from this group, nobody is jockeying to take that role unless leadership is actually one of their particular skills. So then there's, there's, I think there's two parts to this answer. Again, this is, this is peculiar to physicians on the one hand with us being trained, you know, so often to be the person in control, actually training that in your head and being, um, being the, the, the person who's sort of in the back and supporting and offering medical, uh, uh, advice is a really important role. So, um, so patient-centered rescue came out of the Pittsburgh shop and is such an important concept that much of the rescue training that goes on in the world uses mannequins. Again, this is the simulation problem. Like mm -hmm. I've sat at rescues trainings where there's like a basket being carried up a wall and the mannequin's face is smacking against <laughs> the wall the entire time and the crew is high-fiving because their technical rigging system is so sophisticated and they've got a seven to one, you know, it's like technically really cool. The physics behind is great. And I'm like, yeah, but you just like killed your patient. And they're like, oh, oh, the patient. Well, right. Yeah. Well, that'll sort itself out. So being the advocate for the patient in that sense is often a really, really good role and people will defer to that. So if you say, hey, your system is great. This is like very good be aware that this person's been on the ground for five hours and we need to get some wrap for them to prevent hypothermia or, you know, whatever that small input is, it's that kind of like medical um, contribution or an incident command, you know, system, sort of the medical wing where they're like, oh yeah, it's a real person that we're taking care of. So I think that there's real validity to that. And that's the, uh, you know, it's playing bones to, to Captain Kirk. On the other hand, um, 
I'm passionately committed to the idea that physicians do not need to play that role. Mm -hmm. And there's a real problem in operational medicine that once you achieve a certain level of training, you're seen to be outside of the legitimate realm of first aid and operational medicine. And this is hugely problematic. So um, it's to the point where many of us have taken to displaying our credentials as MD paramedic, or I'm an MD EMT. And the reason I'm an MD EMT is that and I've kept my EMT certification because it's different from being a doctor. It has different skill sets. It has different scopes. It's not additive. And I want to be able to sometimes, and this is perverse, but sometimes it's more helpful for me in a swarm setting to say, I'm an EMT and they will put me in and they will, you know, I'll be like on the raft, like going out to help somebody. If I say I'm a doctor, <laughs> they'll say, that's awesome. There's the log that you can sit on and tell us like when we're doing something wrong medically. So I think, you know, fighting this sort of idea that it's the anti-intellectualization of all this, that just because you have more advanced training, it doesn't mean you don't have those skills in that. Yeah, sure. I've seen lots of instances where this is the case. I think it's important for us to, you know, combat that. Well, I think you're, I think you're right in saying, first off, like more advanced skills are not necessarily the right skills for the moment, right? That's not, that's just not true, Right. Like I think we, you know, we sort of nailed that with the ankle fellow versus the swift water rescue technician thought. That said, like it's not always obvious how to assemble the rest of the team around that. I love this bones to Kirk metaphor because I'm a total sci-fi nerd and I think that's like critically important to think through. Uh but it's still not super clear to me how the logistics of how that happens. So what are you seeing, right? Are you seeing, okay, so you know, we're all in a we're all in a room, none of knows who anybody is. We 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 show our credentials. The swift water technicians like, great, I'm in charge of the rescue. I'm taking you and you and you. You're with me. Everybody else, are you speaking up then? Are you saying, okay, I'm I'm a doc, I'll hold home base? Are you volunteering? Or are you seeing teams that self-assemble in some other way that's not like that? Yeah, no, what you described is exactly it. And I think advocating for the position that you feel you are most efficacious in that setting um, is the way to go. Really what I'm saying is be careful about the label that you choose because these are very quick operations and people will, you will become the blank. Sure. And afterwards, they may be really upset to hear that you have 20 years experience in the military and you are a, you know, you were a, a military medic and you have all these like tactile skills. They, their image of a doctor is somebody in a white coat who now doesn't even do anything. They have PAs do everything for them. And I just earlier today, somebody used that analogy. They're like, well, I'm like the PA, I do all the work. And, you know, I tell somebody who just supervises me, I was like, that's not at all what, yeah. you know, operational physicians are. How that works. So, right. Yeah. So being clear about what your, you know, capacity is for that. But yeah, I think, I think, um, we know that that's intuitively how mm. it goes down. All this is very practical. And if human beings are sort of wanting the best for the operation and assuming everybody's, you know, in good faith, trying to make something work, you you just won't quickly want somebody to encapsulate what they can contribute. So if this is something, and, and again, this gets very sort of contextual, but this is the sort of thing that medical students need to learn in a rotation. And I would say anybody needs to learn sure. if they're going to work in this environment is if you're not the person on the sharp end of the rope going down and taking care of, you know, rappelling down and take care of the person who's crumpled, what do the other 20 people do? Yeah. And that's completely valid training, you know, in its own. Somebody has to set up, you know, a command center. Somebody has to communicate with 911. Somebody has to build the LZ that's going to be constructed. Somebody's going to need to talk to the family and they may be patients. Like, you know, the the dude who fells fiance who was belaying him and is, and is, you know, totally distraught. That's a psychological first aid role that, can be huge. And if it's a fatality, that's your patient. And, you know, we know that healthcare professionals can be very well trained in doing work like that and can be very experienced with it. So you, you as the physician might be a great person to be assigned to, I think if we're continuing the Star Trek analogy, this is whoever, whoever, like the, I don't even know what her name is, the Dina or, you know, the, the yeah, therapist. Yeah. Right. But but there's, we know that there's real harm and that PTSD yeah. and things like that can develop. And I can go on and on and on about, you know, the roles that we can play that are very important. And it may not be, you know, physicians. Like if you, if you have a military background and you're used to, you know, working around helicopters or you're used to working on radios, that may be 
what you're going to do is you're going to be the comms out to try to get the rescue teams to come in. What I'm really getting at, and I think this is a bit of a rewiring of the emergency mind, is, mm -hmm. is the humility. Sure. We have, um, somebody once told me, that I love the way they introduced themselves. They said, I'm a, I'm a third year resident. I have been exquisitely trained in taking tests. And, mm. and I think that there's some truth to that, that like, that's what we train people to do is to be high performing, get A's, take tests. But really in this environment, what we're trying to train people to do is goal oriented. It's mm. to accomplish a mission. And if your best role in that, um, if somebody's like, hey, can you hold this IV bag? And you're like, absolutely, I can hold that IV bag. And at the same time, if I see something going sideways, I can tell you. And one way this fits into kind of the normal activities of an EMS physician, and I think every EMS medical director will tell you this, is that when they show up on scenes, they are not the ones doing the patient care. Sure. Like to a person, I think most EMS medical directors would say, and this is the training we get, I'm going to hang back. I'm going to go spike the IV bag. I'm going to get, you know, the airway bag yeah. that they needed. And I, that way, now that's a little different environment, not swarm. You know, that's, that's an intact team mm -hmm. where your role is oversight. So you do want to watch, but also your tendency is to be like, I'm going to get in there and get that airway. And again, that humility and that respect for this paramedic is very well trained to do this. If I go spike the IV bag, I can watch what's happening. So anyway. I think that's a little bit of rewire to, to, to the idea of leadership on a swarm team. Uh, it, it's really interesting. I, I think you see that you see a reflection of that even in the trauma bays that we're working with, right? Because there's this idea. It's funny. We, we actually we sometimes um, in a, in a bizarre uh, linkage to this, we sometimes refer to it as like leave no trace emergency medicine, right? Like the idea that you should like leave everything better than you found it, right? And so you are watching the juniors and even when they don't exactly they're not they're not deleting the resuscitation or they're not doing the airway right they should be doing something they should be helping the team they should be like backing people up and getting things ready for the next thing and there's all this space in there to to move the entire team forward right like when you don't know what else to do clean the field for everybody else right and you're constantly working as a unit in order to make the space better around that um even that in some ways is like the opposite of shadowing which is that you should just like hang off and watch. Like you should always be making the field better for everybody else around you. But I, I'm just, I'm so fascinated by this self-assembling team idea because I, I think it's a, a critical problem set that we see across mission critical teams that we see across the emergency mind workspace in general. And and if, as you're listening to this, one thing I want you to note is that we're not offering a prescription here, right? We are not saying do it exactly this way because I don't think that that's actually how that works. I don't think that there's a real structure that you can deploy every time into it. There are some things that we're saying, right? Humility, move the field forward no matter what you're doing, find ways to be helpful no matter your skill set, recognize that your expertise in one area might or might not translate to the problem set you're facing right now and come in with that, that mindset, that curiosity about it. Um, what else would you put on that list? What other yeah, reusable could, skill would you use for every every set of swarming? Yeah, if I could, yeah, dig in there. So I, I've I've recently become enamored of the uh, the philosophical school of pragmatism, and I think it has huge um, utility for what we're doing uh, in this space. I think there's a great example here of our movement away from spinal immobilization. Um, my so to create a context around that for um, listeners. In the past, we might have said, this is a critical action from the first aid level to the practitioner level. You have to hold the head in a certain way. You have to prevent the neck from moving in a certain way if you're concerned somebody has a spinal injury. And across all levels of care, we would we would reinforce this. And it was a skill. Um, similar to other skills that we teach people, you have to do this. Like bad things will happen if you don't. My concern about skills-based operations is that you can lose the eventual endpoint. So for generations, teaching people, like we would have entire practice guidelines around spinal mobilization and studies to see, have we immobilized the neck well enough and what immobilizes the neck better than other things? And it completely missed the point that what we were actually trying to do was prevent further injury to the spinal cord. And if you took a huge step back, and you said, and you used a goal-oriented approach, mm. and you said, what are we trying to do? And the answer was, we don't want this person to be paralyzed 
because of something that we allowed them to do or we did to them? That's a whole different question. And what right. happened, and this is a little bit of like the opioid story in medicine, is what we happened. What happened is we learned that what we've been doing yeah. for half a century actually didn't have anything to do with the goal that we thought we were trying to accomplish. And in fact, it was hurting people. So the other analogy to this would be like compression only CPR. So we've gotten really good at training people to do compression only CPR. And they think that's the answer to a cardiac arrest. And they come in and they wave their card and they say, compression only CPR is the answer for this. And it's a drowning. Mm. And compression only CPR is the wrong, you know, the wrong answer to that question. And so I think one other thing, and I said this earlier, but maybe these are examples to really drive home the fact that there needs to be a goal-oriented approach rather than a process-oriented approach is as that team is assembling and trying to figure out what the heck is happening and what they're going to do about it, one of the very first things to, to determine is what is the outcome we actually want from this? Because we're, we're, you know, and it sounds again simple, but at the first aid level, we have a lot of people that we've exquisitely trained to do the wrong thing and disrupting that and saying, no, no, I know that you were trained to say we can't move this patient, but it's an avalanche field. So just remember yeah, yeah, that right. you know, you, we need to get them out of the avalanche field, even though I know you've been taught in your first aid class, never touch a patient and they, you know, they will explode if you try to move them, but which is you know, a joke, but things like immobilizing the C-spine or only doing compression. You know, there have been debates that people have had over drowned patients where the paramedic is trying to do ventilations and the first aider is like, no, that's totally wrong. I just certified last week. So yeah. disrupting that a little bit is helped by saying, let's just start from the perspective that we want to figure out what we want to accomplish. If you want to have this patient end up walking and not be paralyzed, I can assure you because- I'm a physician and this is what I do, that that goal will be accomplished by doing this arrangement, even though I know that you were trained in first aid to do it another way. And that helps people understand why you might be doing something that disrupts what their perception mm -hmm. is. Of. Because, right, the thing, the hard thing about this is when conflicts come up. Sure. The hard thing is when people have disagreements about how something should be done. And I think if, if yeah. the more that we can disrupt dogma and make, so I guess what I'm saying is in a first aid level, it's important to make that teaching apparent that we are teaching you a protocol and a like way to do something because sure. in most situations, this will be the most important, but it doesn't have to be dogma or absolute. And that helps to pre-plant, you know, a little bit of this is that prepare that's like before the incident, mm -hmm. you know, personnel who are there to, to, um, to understand that if I was going to run a first day class, I would say like, Hey, we all need to recognize this is going to be goal oriented and your first aid is going to be directed around getting the goal that you want to accomplish. Hmm. And how do you, how do you accomplish that when you're on the X, when you're on mission, right? Are you saying, are you saying to your team, team, our goal is blah, blah, blah. Or is this a direction? Is this a democratic vote where you're like, team, what is our goal? Or how are you, how are you dictating that? And then a second question to that would be actually, how do you dictate that when you're not the one necessarily in charge of that point in the moment? Yeah, that's exactly where I was going is the two bins. So that the mm -hmm. authority bin, um, I have some opinions about that, which are not sure. uh, politically not not always uh well received. But in the EMS world, there's a um there's a there's a movement to say that what we provide to paramedics and delegated practice personnel are guidelines, and we expect mm -hmm. no protocol can ever encompass everything. Um, we expect them to make good decisions within those guidelines. You know, one thing I would argue for in the in the X is to actually have protocols and actually have if it is a delegated role, not ha not to even have that that dialogue. So then, if you have a position of of authority, you don't want to be having debates in real time with um with personnel until you're reading the room until you're getting to that point where you're saying what all do you have to contribute and you're creating a space where people can like offer their opinions but you're the sole decision maker and i do feel like that's really important because there are times when we could not have accomplished what we needed to do if we were having a review of the literature you know <laughs> in real time like that's sure. the time you need command and control and i do think that's mm -hmm. So I do think we need to protect that for those delegated practice roles and 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 have lots of room for dialogue. That and the end result is there's somebody in charge. On the other hand, if you are truly um, 
in a space where you're building rapport and you're building, you're, you're not just reading the room as a leader or, or utilizing the room, I guess, is the, there's mm-hmm. the, the term that you have for it. Um, in that case, I think that's completely around psychology. It's around building rapport. It's around building credibility. And uh, I do think that there's, in, especially when it's on the X in the sense that there's a rapid decision that needs to be made, that's when being assertive about, you know, credentials and practical reasons why um, what you're saying is meaningful do become important. And, you know, having the humility to recognize when it's not your lane is important, but also sure. if you're asserting, no, this is what I do and we really should be doing it this way. And the reason is that our goal is to accomplish this. And I can assure you that this gotcha. will get to that goal. If your goal is simply to like check off a box on your first aid training, you will have accomplished that, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to actually get this patient, you know, home to their family. Yeah. That's, that's an awesome distinction. And that depth of knowledge of understanding the why underneath why you do something and when to map one piece of it versus another piece to the situation in front of you is critically important and also really hard to teach and instill at the same time right and i think we're 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 just scratching the surface of how to do that and still too much in medicine i think we rely on osmosis to figure that out more than anything else and if i can bring all this home that's yeah. why we need to be in the field that's why we need to have training that matches the operational environment you know train like you fight you cannot adequately simulate these very complicated situations so mm-hmm. My hope is in my environment is if I take these students and I just put them out, you know, into the wild, into the wilderness, literally, and these things happen, nothing's filtered, nothing's preset. There's no, you know, it is what it is. And you're, and you're, and I think that authenticity is something that for very specialized roles, not just medicine, but, but other ones, for some reason, we feel like we are okay to simulate them and not put people out into the actual space. I'm a big fan of, so we've had these, ex- the, the scenarios that you're describing, we have had the exact debates over the patient about how sure. something has been done. And, and oftentimes it's in the regulated practice of, you know, medicine and the paramedic disagrees with what, you know, you want to do. And getting that, getting facile with that negotiation is its own, almost sure. sort of like you're saying, unteachable. It's a, it's a debrief and, evolution step because it's such a, that's such the learned skill. Yeah. But you're going to run into that, whether or not you're practicing on the side of a mountain or in a hospital or anything else, right? There's always going to be differential, like mental models of how things are working and navigating the the web of connections between that to galvanize your team from the top, from the side, from the bottom. It doesn't matter where you're standing in order to attack the problem set the way it needs to be attacked to lead by influence and nudging, that's that's so crucial to the practice of emergency medicine in general, wherever you're going to do it. And I would suggest that this space is so useful for that. There's so much complexity in this, you know, in this practice of rescue and um, search and rescue and wilderness EMS. So many of the things that we're talking about are intensified there because the things that are in small ways present in a hospital or in very large ways present in those spaces and authority is diffused. Things are very circumstantial elements like, you know, rain and cold and dark come in that we don't, you know, normally deal with. And, um, and then there's all sorts of legal and jurisdictional sort of things. So I do think that like as a testing ground and as a training ground, it's ideal. So um, I do think that, you know, for people that really want to learn these skills building more of these sort of experiences where people are, are um, really training to failure in spaces that (laughs) promote failure (laughs) that make it, you know, harder are really useful. So this has been absolutely amazing, man. I, I want to give you a chance as we're wrapping up here to issue a parting challenge to everybody. Um, And while you're thinking about that for a second, I'm going to put out my normal boilerplate disclaimer on the end of this and say that our goal here at the Emergency Mind Project is to develop the skills that we need in order to succeed as individuals, teams, and organizations in times of stress, pressure, and emergency. It's never to deliver medical advice, and neither Seth's comments nor my comments represent anybody other than ourselves. So just toss that in as a parting shot. Give you give you a second to collect your thoughts and think, and then I'll turn it back over to you. What's your challenge? What do you want people to do differently as they're listening to this? 
Yeah, I, I build off just what you're saying about art. So I love your goal-directed summation. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, my, that's my thing. And our goal here is to develop skills. And I think in an essay quam videre, to be rather than to appear to be model, scrutinize what, what your credentials are and how those map onto actual skills. So um, if you want to be doing something or playing a role in the swarm team, or you want to have efficacy in a setting, do you have a card that says that you do something or an alphabet soup certificate that you haven't actually touched somebody in that way or applied that skill for you know 20 years? Or are you keeping that alive with the with the goal, again, being efficacy and not appearance? Um, that would be my challenge to people would be uh, review what you think you do and what you think you can do and match that up against what would happen if you actually had to apply that skill, no matter what it is, in any environment, in reality, two hours from now, and um, how well do your credentials map onto your actual skill sets? So cool. Seth, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, where can folks reach you? Where should they, all these people that are listening to this that now want to sign up for your externship, where should they go for it? Where, <laughs> where do you want to direct people to? So the externship is awkward because by definition and intent, our goal, um, we only take two medical students or residents a year. So right on. It's sort of exquisitely intensive, but we do take two. So we'd love applications. Everything there lives at hawkventures.com. Okay. Hawk Ventures is the structure that we have around it. But we do have a program at the end of the externship that's a seminar, which is a one-day training for practitioners, um, meaning people who provide medical oversight, and then a two-day summit uh, in Pisgah National Forest that's open to anyone. It's completely in the field, no PowerPoint, all hands-on. We're basically living out the things that we're describing. That's always in September. And all that lives at hawkventures.com. I'm in Twitter at hawkvox, H-A-W-K-V-O-X, also uh, Instagram there and on Facebook. Amazing. Seth, thank you. So great to be on the podcast and really appreciate what you're doing for our industry.